is up, App Nation. It is Steve P. Young, founder of AppMasters.com. And welcome to our weekly Friday YouTube live stream where obviously it's live. We take a look at your apps. We have an expert guest on to really break down the strategies that led to their app growth. And today I've got a phenomenal guest and I'm super excited to talk to. Her name is Alana Harvey. She is the CMO and co-founder of Flip, a app that combines productivity, but also talks about celebrating screen time. So many times we think about screen time, we're like negative, you know, I've got kids and I point here because she's always hanging out here, my daughter, but we think about it being a negative thing, but flip kind of turned, flipped it around and said, Hey, this could actually be a positive <laughs> thing. So she combines productivity. And then one of the things that users of flip love are the community aspects. So I want to get into all that and so much more, but Lana, welcome to the show. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. Congrats on all the success. So some of the numbers that we have, you reached 2.6 million users, 1.2 million in revenue. So congrats on all that. And then you got a fancy little photo shoot with Apple as well, being featured hundreds of time in App of the Day too. So congrats on all the success. <laughs> What's been the best part? Thanks. This? Sorry? What's been the best part of all this? The best part about building an app that has, I guess, reach, reaches app of the day, in my opinion, has been um, the evolution that we've gone through. So um, our app, we launched on the App Store back in 2016. And I definitely would be embarrassed to see that MVP today. Um, and I think it's just one of those experiences that watching the product um, evolve both from a design perspective and a user experience perspective. And also, as you mentioned, a community perspective. So our users now connect with each other. We have Discord communities. We have users connecting on Instagram and just users from all over the world who connect with each other in and outside of Flipped. Um, it's, it's really, it's become really meaningful to me. Um, and I think for any any app developer or, or smaller app company out there who's trying to build something like this, um, I would just say don't be afraid to evolve and go through that evolution. That transformation for me has meant the success that you're that you're showcasing right now. Um, and had we been afraid of going through that process, um, I don't think I would be here speaking with you. So, not being afraid of change, embracing that change for sure. I love it. Talk to me about the early. So what were you seeing in the market? I know you guys started out being like, hey, you know, I want to help people manage their screen time. But what was that initial concept like? And then we'll get into more questions after that. Yeah, for sure. So early days flipped like we came up with the concept um, in like 2015. Uh, this was well before the screen time app on iPhones even existed. Um, and really what we were trying to build was a sort of a, a similar concept to screen time, but also one that would actually drive users to make a conscious effort to not be distracted by their phone. Um, and so we had initial like early day features. We had the ability to block someone else's devices device from yours. Um, this, of course, was only available actually on Android because we could never replicate it on iOS. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which was an interesting uh, sort of use case and one that we did get a, an early following. We got written about um, a couple of times in the media for that specific use case. So for example, you'd have a parent who wants to block their kid from using their phone. Um, and you can see that there are now some apps uh, that still exist that do do that. Um, but over the years, we found that this, this concept of like um, negative connotation to phone use was not really where we wanted to go. And we wanted to reframe that into, um, you know, what could, we, what could we be doing with our phones that actually produces positive behavior and reinforces positive habits around screen time? Um, and that's when we started to notice that a lot of users were students and they were using flipped to track their focus time or track their productivity um because outside of just blocking your app we did have features that were like measure how much time you spent away from your phone for example 
And so we started to lean into that concept a lot more. Um, we also actually, there was a point in time for a couple of years that we had features that supported university classes where uh, professors were incentivizing students to not use their phones during a lecture. Um, and so they would give them like students who participated using flipped would be given points, for example. Um, and that was just one way that that flipped was kind of used in early days when we first launched. Um, and the I mean, the evolution into that, again, we just really leaned into the student use case um, and started recognizing that there was a need for social productivity features as well. So making it possible for students to virtually like feel like they're studying with other people. Um, of course, the pandemic really helped with that as well. Um, but yeah, now the product is all about solo studying, solo productivity measurement, where you can keep track of all of your study sessions, tag them, you can keep track of your insights, see your performance over time. But then also the social studying aspect where you can join productivity communities, study groups. Um, you can also like join live study rooms with other people, your friends or public ones that were created. Um, sometimes by influencers on like we have study gram influencers who like create study groups. So it's, it's really evolved into this social studying app that, um, yeah, that you're, that you see now on the app store. I love it. I mean, I love the tagline, the social productivity app that makes you feel good. So I like that. Thanks. Hey, you know, boys, I've worked with a few different types of apps like this. And you know, sometimes I hear don't target students. They can't pay you. How did you guys go yeah. about to Guys, think about that. How have you gone about like generating over a million dollars now to a segment that you're like, oh, you know, they don't got money. That's why they're a student. Yeah, you know, that's a that's a really good question. So, um, as I mentioned, like early on when we were targeting university classrooms, well, not that wasn't the earliest. So it was parents first. Then we shifted towards uh, university classes, and we noticed that we were able to generate revenue from. Um, the college professors and uh, the institutions and institutions themselves. But then also at that time, uh, we were including like the option for students to pay instead. Um, and so we knew that if we were requiring students to pay as part of like their their in class requirement, um, it's kind of unfair. Like it, it's not it's not the best thing. You know, you have to go to class, and your your professor says, "Hey, you have to buy this app in order to get these points in my class." So we wanted to make sure that the product also provided that value that students would see through like their productivity insights or productivity analytics. Um, and that was really sort of the beginnings of a subscription model that we started um, after after like at the, at the beginning beginning of the pandemic, we actually shut down that um, that sort of education channel because obviously in class participation was not as much of a, a thing at the time at the beginning of the pandemic. So that was just one channel that we ended up letting go of. Um, but from there, we were able to learn that um, what was really needed if we were going to um, focus on a subscription model. Um, and what we really did with Flipped is target, uh, or we created a, a user persona. Um, and that for us was high achieving students. And so we knew that high achieving students are the type of users who are going to invest in the things like the tools and the resources that they know that they need in order um, to improve their productivity. You know, if if they need to buy the books that they need for their their courses, they're going to make sure they get the most up to date ones. You know, if they need to buy pens and journals and all of the different software that they might need to make sure that they're successful, they're going to do that. Um, so it was that high achieving student user persona that we really leaned into. Um, and I think that that really helped us sort of carve out like what exactly needed to be included in the subscription. Um, we also tested out a lot of free trial um, concepts early on. So it was like either a two week, seven day, one month, we tried all of the different subscription models to or uh, free trials within our subscription model to see what would convert best. Um, and really what we noticed is one of the best uh, conversions is a monthly subscription because it's low cost. And as you say, like students, they are they are um, a little bit strapped for cash. And so a low cost monthly subscription, something that costs less than a cup of coffee um, is definitely something that resonates with our audience. Um, and so fine tuning our pricing to get to that point um, has honestly taken years um, and a lot of product research, customer research, um, 
you know, we we do like in-depth user discovery and interviews and surveys because we have over 150,000 monthly active users. We're able to do those types of, of um, surveys with our active user base to understand, you know, is a product really delivering what they need? Um, if not, what more could we be doing to really uh, get it to that point? Um, and I think I think that it's a bit of a it's a bit of a myth that these users are are not willing to pay for something because I think if you get the right value and the right price, um, that there's definitely an opportunity there at least for for them to potentially pay. Um, it definitely it at least increases the chances that they will. Um, yeah. And I think like it's it we will continuously be fine tuning that. Um, but I think we've gotten closer and closer to to where we need to be. I like it. Hey, I want to say hi to a few people, but I also want to get into the early days. Mile, well, what's up? Yash, yeah, good to see you. Adil, good to see you. Adrian says, hi, team. How have I not seen this before? It is so cool. So kudos to you. <laughs> and, and then Buzz here, what's up, dude? Good to see you. He's actually in Atlanta. So, no. We got <laughs> what I want to get into as well is the talk to me about the early marketing strategies because I think a lot of times you know I'm work I work with you know I talk to a lot of indies and startups and it's the the early days where maybe you're not getting that many downloads. What were some of the marketing strategies that got you to start seeing some momentum that you said, hey, we got something here? Yeah. So early on, I mean, I started this company with my co-founder when I was only about 24 years old. I was a recent grad from marketing and communications in Toronto. Um, and really like one of the only things that I really knew how to do at the time was pitch the media. Um, I'm a good writer, so I really wanted to just try that. Um, and it worked. I, I pitched local news and I was able to get flipped written about in a couple of key uh, publications locally. And then I used sort of the same model to pitch other outlets. Um, and I think uh, early days I got flipped when it was initially launched on Android. I had it written about a handful of times. Um, and a lot of this was pitched around that sort of story and that messaging of screen time. So at the time, um, screen time and overusage of our phones and all the mental health implications that come with that um, were, it was a very like popular story. It was something that everyone was talking about. So I really sort of wrote on the coattails of that and was like, hey, we're developing this app that's now live if you want to check it out. And it it helps users reduce their screen time. Like that's our mission. Um, and so just really making sure that I was telling like a concise story of from, from uh, like it didn't matter who I was pitching, but that that story remained consistent across the board. Um, and then when we were able to launch on iOS, I sort of used all of the media that we had previously on uh, like coverage for Android and said like this app that everyone was so excited about for Android is finally launching for iOS. Um, and I actually pitched TechCrunch um, for our iOS launch and I got it, um, shockingly. But I was very proud um, that we got into TechCrunch for our iOS launch. Um, and prior to that, we had done a whole rebrand. And so we were kind of like a lot more excited. You know, I said that original MVP wasn't all that great, but we were finally, you know, sort of getting better with our branding. Um, and like I said, the brand messaging was all very cohesive. Um, and from there, like we continue to use like the publications that we already got, like, like using big names, whether it was TechCrunch, um, you know, it was, yeah, <laughs> you found it. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, yeah, you can see 2016. Isn't that wild? I'm that's like, we took that photo. We didn't have someone come in and do it professionally. So, um, I like it. that's crazy. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, from there, like we were able to use that kind of story to continue to pitch bigger and bigger news outlets. Um, and I would say like up until pretty much 2019, like I ended up hiring someone to do all of our PR um, internally, which was actually um, also very, like I was very 
glad that we were able to do that internally rather than like outsourcing to an agency, which would have been way more expensive. Um, so I just had someone on my team who is super passionate about uh, like pitching the media and PR strategies. So um, that worked out, continued to work out really well for us. And we got, you know, into the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, um, NPR. And a lot of it ended up talking about that that sort of new product where we were targeting classrooms and, and reducing screen time in the classroom. Um, but overall, like you can see that it's it's all about crafting that early message and sticking to it. Um, so knowing exactly what the story is that you're trying to tell and, and making sure that it's consistent across the board. Um, and to be honest, now that we are like a social productivity app that doesn't have some of the features that were previously mentioned in these media publications, we still have people coming to us asking if we have those features, which we don't anymore. Um, mm. And so it's interesting to know like that those that sort of level of media will continue to live on with your product um, and just proves that like making sure that the having that type of consistent messaging, it, it literally will continue to be true for your product. Um, so outside of like completely relaunching something, you have to make sure that like, OK, if this, if people are coming to your app and it's it's not it's now no longer doing what people are writing about that it did do once upon a time, you have to make it possible for people to understand like what does it do now that maybe relates to what it used to do, um, or like in our case, we actually did relaunch a second app that has features of that sort of screen time um, distraction management. So we have a second app and we drive people from inside of Flipped who maybe landed on Flipped because of the media attention uh, to go to that second app that we now have, because we know that some people are going to be looking for it. Um, they have no interest cool. in social studying and that's fine. Um, but it's just making sure that we're, that we're catering to the user who maybe arrives at our app as a result. There you go. Focus lock. Yeah. I like it. It's yeah. Really cool. You know, one of my favorite strategies, and I've talked about this in the past, but we don't actually do much PR anymore. So I'm curious to know if you think PR is still worth sort of the investment and the time. But one of my favorite strategies and what you kind of highlighted too was, hey, start with the local publications, like start with something that you know you can get into and then work your way up and then leverage all that publication in your pitch to be like, look, we've already been featured in all these publications. Would you want to feature us? And when I also so to do, and I'm going to go to TechCrunch, for example, is give some of these reporters, find the right reporter that might be the fit for my story and give her or him the exclusive on the launch. And that usually gets their attention versus just sending an email. Do you have any tips from a PR side? Yeah, that's exactly what we did. So um, we would sort of target um, a reporter or writer who we knew that they were talking about app launches or maybe they talked about a, a, an app or a company's like fundraising or something like that recently that is in the space that we're in. Um, so someone who is familiar with productivity would be for us, like who we'd be pitching. Um, and when I had someone on my team doing this, they were, um, they were doing the outreach like through Twitter. So they would connect with someone and say like, Hey, I have a really great story for you. Or I loved the story that you wrote. And I'd like to suggest a follow-up story that is in like a similar beat. Um, and so that, yeah, that worked out really well for us. And of course, having press that is like well, well researched and, um, from a well-known publication already talking about your product um, that you you want to like work at, on with that momentum, like just continue uh, to get more writers to keep, keep on writing about you. And then eventually, which was what happened for us, we would start getting um, just written about organically. Like we get featured um, in places all the time and still do um, without us needing to do any press outreach because there's enough sort of background research um, that's already been done that people can go, okay, if I'm going to write about a couple of productivity apps for students, well, I'm going to include flipped in that because I know that it's a reliable source. Yeah. That's really cool. I like it. And the next yeah. thing I want to move on to is community. And I talked to a few people already, especially in the beginning days where they're like, look, it's going to be a community. And I'm like, I don't like to use that word in the very beginning because you have no users. So I'm kind of like, yes, it's a phase two type of thing, but did you guys always have community in mind and how did you go about launching the community aspect of that, of the app? Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that interestingly, we, we kind of had a community experience in the app pretty early on, mostly because um, when 
we were working in uh, classrooms. Um, flipped was you had to like join your classroom. So you had to like, you had to sign into the app and then enter a code and that would put you into your classroom group. Um, and so that that sort of community experience was already tailored into the app experience. Um, and it's the same way that it, like it works, it works the same way now where users can join a social studying group, they can create their own. Um, there's like a, a list of, of free public groups that they can join. Um, and if depending on, is this focus lock or are you, there we go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm getting so yeah, for talking. example, <laughs> you can jump into a library timer there um, and you can see who else is working with you at the same time. So there's that product experience where community already exists. Um, and so in order mm. to support that sort of out of product, we created, we have like a Discord community as well that people can join uh, where we have about almost like 1500 users already there as well. Um, and then Instagram and, and working with micro influencers within the StudyGram community was really strong for us for um, like since a couple of years, we've actually been working with micro influencers on Instagram. So um, I think I think like making sure that if you in order to have a good community, I would say that you need to have like a good product. Um, so it it comes like product first, but I wouldn't say that community is not is not necessarily something that you can build early on. Um, you just have to have people who love what you're doing, love what you're building, and want to share it with others. Yeah, I like what you have done here. Like this is social proof. I use a intermittent fasting app called Zero, and they used to do this. Yeah. I don't know if they do this anymore, but they're like. Yeah, they don't they don't have it, but they used to have it main screen like this too, and saying like one hundred thousand or whatever number it was are fasting too. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool, right? And I really like this the the way you guys have built this. So you could see the people here. Yeah, and you have the low finals that you can check out too. But it feels like, all right, I'm not alone studying for my final. <laughs> yeah, got people all around the world doing this. And the reason that we did avatars actually instead of people's images was because we knew that. Um, students especially uh being our target mm -hmm. audience can get easily distracted by seeing other people's images um and they can mm -hmm. also feel uh like inadequate or you know misrepresented or there's just all these potential feelings and emotions that can come up if you are seeing someone else's face um and so we did a lot of research into like what was the right type of avatars? Like we even thought like, should it be like animal, like cute animals or something like that? Or like what sort of illustration should it be like the illustration of a person? And so we ended up with these like sort of cartoonish um, blobs that like aren't really anything. Um, but in a way they also like the emotions on their faces are what represent a user. Um, and you can change your avatar every day if you wanted to. Um, and it's just like, it helps, it helps prevent that sense of like um not feeling good enough if you're in a room compared to a bunch of other people like in this library for example um yeah and yeah you can see people like they change their usernames those are those are all things that that users do on their own without um us prompting them to um so sometimes people will put their instagram profile as their username so that they know that they can connect with people offline or i guess off app <laughs> yeah I like it. Well, I'm in the app. Do you want to show off any other cool features? Um, yeah, well, if you finish, you could take a look at the stats page as well. Mm -hmm. Actually, well, we're on the subject of community, so just exit out of that. Um, okay. And take a look at the community page, so groups at the bottom. I guess I have to finish my profile. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So that's part of our onboarding, uh, which where we're like, in order to be part of the community, you do have to have a name. Um, you also have to have selected an avatar. So if you quickly jump through that, um, it'll show you. I like it. It's really well designed. <laughs> like you can feel, it feels good. Check it out. I'll say I'm a graduate. I like it. Yeah, really tailored. Let's do this. Yeah. This one.
Oh, wow. Yeah, so here, here's where you can see like the different public um, communities that exist on the app. And so these are all created, they're user generated, but then we're highlighting, um, well, the challenges are actually created by us, um, but other, all the other groups are user generated. Um, and so we're highlighting groups that are most active here. Um, and so people can join these groups, you can study with other people inside of private, um, or sorry, public live study rooms, um, but you can also compete on global leaderboard challenges as well. So um, it's a pretty interesting and fun way for people who might otherwise need to be studying alone um, to actually feel like they're studying with other people and they're part of something. Nice. Ilana, yeah. Was it groups? Was it a product? Do you remember like a certain product feature that you launched that you're like, whoa, this like really helped with our retention with our growth metrics, anything that comes to mind? Um, I would say that what's really helped with uh, retention has been the improvement of our stats feature. Um, so you won't have mm -hmm. really much in it if you were to check it out right now because you don't have any stats yet. Um, but the more that a user uses the product, the more stats that they generate, um, the more of their historical progress they can track. Um, mm -hmm. and then that will help with them returning. Um, and so we've really been, um, continuously iterating on this feature. Um, so that's just the insights. There is another page that's, that's like, it ha it should be showing all of your stats, um, in like a graph form and there's pie charts and tags and all that. Yeah. Um, because you don't have anything yet, it's not filled in. Um, yeah. but there, yeah, <laughs> this this one feature took many different iterations, um, and the, really? when we relaunched it earlier this year, we definitely saw that it led to an improvement on um, like the first four weeks of retention for new users. You know, I'm so glad you bring it up because I think this is going to apply to almost any app, right? And I think about the apps that I use on a daily basis and. I love the stats, <laughs> like the, the workout yeah. apps that I use, like the Peloton app. Like, yeah, I have a day streak that I want to keep alive. My fasting app, I, you know, like how, what's the average fast I've done the past seven days. It almost keeps me coming back. And it's, it's tricking my mind to be like, look, I got to come back the next day because I want my stats. I want to pad my stats a little bit too. So I, yeah. I really like this feature a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. We also actually have a day streak feature. It's right on the homepage. So um, it's one of those things where it's like, hi, Alana, like you're currently on this day streak, right? Um, and so we we noticed that like your personal productivity stats was really important to users. Um, the more feedback that we were getting as, as the app grew over time. So um, for example, like if this was like a bug that we noticed that um, if there was a like a, cha a time change, like, you know, daylight savings, um, that some users for some reason, maybe if they had manually changed their time, that uh, their day streak yeah. would be like, would be lost. And so we were getting that feedback. We're like, oh my gosh, we obviously have to fix this for users. But just the fact that we were getting so many users saying that that was an issue for them indicated to us that this is really important. Um, obviously, we also use Amplitude and, and, and track um, other events that to help us understand what's most important to users, but it's that anecdotal feedback that has also really helped us understand, you know, what's most important to our users. That's funny. I love it. We went to Fiji over <laughs> the summer and I did not change the time on my phone because I was like, no, I'm losing a day on the plane <laughs> just because of the time zone jump. And I got to make sure I, I hit my daily streak. That doesn't end. It's like ridiculous <laughs> daily streak that I did not end because of that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, right. I never, I've never really experienced that. So I wasn't really sure um, to, to know like what that might feel like from a user's perspective. So it's helpful to get their stories about it. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Bravo thing that's going on as well. What's up, Luke? You're late. A bit um, odd to me. Um, I'm not, I, I'm understanding from what it seems like that this is trying to be like, you create a plate um, and that's, like you're sharing your plate um, from their messaging. But 
I think from like a keyword perspective, that is a really tricky thing to try to compete on, especially when you are competing against like the Instagrams and Snapchats and, and TikToks in a social photo sharing app. So that's a really difficult space already to get a footing in um, because there's so many alternatives out there. Um, but it would be really, really useful if the name of the app, the description um, and like the subtitle all very clearly we're stating that this is like a photo only sharing app. Like I'm assuming it's not video. It's really geared towards either someone who's passionate about photography um, or people who just care about sharing their photos only um, and building a community of people who want to follow photos. Like I, I think that there is an opportunity there. Um, I also would say that having um, the developer's name as the developer of the uh, like the company name underneath um i think i think can potentially deter people from from trusting it because it's an individual rather than a company um and so mm -hmm. i would suggest that like come up with a company name to support what you're doing um could also help because people see this when they when they go to the app store they see that it's from uh for us it's from flipped ink we are flipped um i think like just that understanding that there's a company behind the app i think is helpful um rather than just like one person um at least that's how it appears it may not be true but it that's how it would appear if you had the person's name as the or the developer's name as the company name um obviously the star rating is excellent even though there's only a handful of ratings at least on the us app store it's a, off to a really good start um and to be honest i like that the screenshots are simple screenshots of the app um I think it's helpful to just see those that like the, the app UI from the app store screenshots. So I think outside of just the way that it's communicated through its messaging and the name of the product, um, I think that uh, this developer is doing a pretty good job. Yeah, I like this. Like the these type of reviews or testimonies are ones that I like. At first, I didn't see the appeal, but after creating a couple of plates and getting good reactions from the community. I saw the potential in this app. Great support team that is always willing to have an open line of communication. Yeah, so Tech, I, I'm very, I'm not sure. It looks like you're targeting professional photographers. So I would make it known that that's what it is. I think this text is tiny. I'm, I'm blowing this up on the web, but I think it's super tiny when you're in the actual app store. And when we're talking about ASO, mm -hmm. like the keywords, there's just not like photo sharing. Don't go after that. You have Instagram. You're, competing with behemoths like think about yeah other keywords and nobody searches for photography community in my opinion i don't know i guess i could pull the data on that but my guess is going to be nobody searches for that so like you'll have to kind of leverage other types of apps like this and maybe think about what photo professional photographers are using if that's your target market and think about keywords along those lines and even running some Apple search ads, targeting some of your bigger competitors, not Instagram, but like, I don't know, that's like that's, that professional photographers consistently use. That might be more interesting to drive growth than just having this. This isn't worth it. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Social app for photographers. Yeah. All right. Let me take a quick peek yeah. at his ASL. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, well, I was just going to say there's also the opportunity, like the communication opportunity here to show that this is a different product from uh, like the Instagrams and the Snapchats. Um, Steve, just wondering, like if you know the name of that app that's really like that blew up they've been around for like a little while now but they where they send you like a push notification and then you have to post a photo like or a video at that time they're really popular right now and i can't remember what the name of it is, is it one second every day by any chance or i know of time hop but that's like old memories if someone in the uh, chat has like knows what i'm talking about i would love to <laughs> I, it's at the tip of my tongue, but anyways, it's a it's an app that um, was kind of trying to go, it, it kind of going against the whole like scrolling on social media and like also just showing the best part of your day. And it just set, sends you a push notification once a day um, and you have to post within like a couple of minutes. What's the name of that app? Be Real. Be Real. Be Real. Thank you. Yes, yes, it's Be Real. Yes. So 
I mean, I think that it took them a, (laughs) I think that it took them a while to get like that recognition for the, what they were trying to do differently Mm -hmm. from their, you know, social media counterparts. Um, but I think that that really like sticking to your guns on that um, has ultimately paid off huge for them and they've gone completely viral. Right. Um, and I think like there is a possible opportunity to do something similar here where it's like uh, making sure that the, that the, the communication strategy and the messaging is telling that story of like, well, actually you can come to my photo sharing app and it's, and that's all it is. It's photos. It's like, back to the good stuff, you know, like using that um, as a strategy and including that in the name of the product and all of that, I think would be um, a really interesting, rather than necessarily being a photography community. I'm not like, I'm not sure if that's the intention, Um, but yeah. 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 Does that resonate? It does resonate. And I completely agree with you. And then on my note with photography community, there's no search traffic for this particular keyword phrase so it's not worth it like glass might be more interesting but yeah completely agree with you and it it almost feels like an app where you know unlike flipped where people are searching for like a focus timer or study timer type of thing people are not searching for this type of stuff so i think what be real did now i have no insight on how they did their marketing but it feels like a big ad campaign or working with influencers running tiktok ads it almost feels like for a social network at, app, you need to drive UA. Paid UA is the way to go because nobody's really searching mm-hmm. for this type of term. All right, let's yeah. get into the app really quick. And then, how are you on time? You okay? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, <laughs> thanks. We'll go really quickly <laughs> into the plates. Yeah. No problem. app for creating your photos and discovering great photographers. Okay. Okay, so then it is. So it is for photographers. Okay. I still don't know what a plate is, but okay. I'd love to understand is like a plate. Um, if it's a photography term, then maybe I'm totally off base here. And that actually is, um, the right communication strategy, but I'm, I'm not familiar with it. So. What? So Tark, you're in the comments. So let us know what it is. What's a plate. Because I, I read a couple of reviews and they were like quoting plates and then I was like, okay, so maybe it's not a term that we should know. This is really slow right now for me. Try again. Okay. Let's try this way. A shortcut. Yes. <laughs> you don't see anything in our big. Yeah. Apple's pretty good about that. <laughs> the old one. Like a few categories. I love travel. another travel that's weird wait was i uh, travel two travels one london all right how do i get out of this though i'm gonna hit back it started by creating plate plate is collaborative for them for your trips okay i mean i don't know it's a photo album so it's dark says it's like a metaphor for sharing like you create a plate, think of it as a photo album. I think I would lead with that, right? Create a plate. Plate is like it's a photo album. I mean, you kind of say it, collaborative photo album. So. Yeah, I would just say that like plate is a very um like has connotations to food. So yeah. Is it a food photo sharing app? Maybe that, maybe that should be sort of the niche that you lead with. Um I don't know if that's if 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 plate is a, like a really important part of the strategy. So, yeah. 
I don't know. I don't these type of things. I'm kind of like the way I think about it is if you're an indie developer trying to get this going, it's going to be super hard. You probably need to be a little bit have some type of funding because to get any type like be real great example is like the only reason I knew yeah. about it was top of like number one up, right? It's like you need some big push and obviously a good product to keep the users from the big push on the platform as well. But doesn't it feels like a like you need to raise some money to make this really grow. I mean, I'm sure you can start off just like ground grassroots, but it almost feels like, yeah, if, if I was doing grassroots, I'd look at the different communities out there like Reddit, maybe Facebook groups, wherever these photographers yeah. live. Dribble, I don't know if Dribble is a thing for photographers and more for graphic designers, but figure out where they live and then reach out to them and be like, hey, this is what we're trying to do and then go that route. Yeah, I would agree. If the audience is photographers, then to find where photographers live um and communicate with each other and then make sure like go and infiltrate those channels and ask them to use your app and get their feedback directly you know does it solve a pain point um that needs to be solved for them if not what other platforms and apps are they already using um to solve this problem um you know are they putting all their portfolios onto instagram already then do you have like a huge competitive um or what is your competitive advantage compared to something like Instagram or where else they might be posting their photos. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's important to understand like what is this user's need um, and why they would switch to your app if they're already using something else. Um, Cause it's, it looks like it's beautifully made and there's been a lot of thought that's gone into it. Um, maybe the onboarding could have been a little bit uh, like the UI could, could be a little bit more appealing. Um, just with those like text fields at the beginning or like why I need to put my username right at the beginning. I'm not so sure, but um, right. yeah, I think, I think there's potential. Um, but really understanding the user problem is, is, is probably a really good, good um, place to start. Yeah. And I think it needs to be a little bit different, like be real, you know, be real, like, Hey, put a photo of you, you in action right now and send it off to your friends, not social media different right if you think about TikTok becoming a new social platform different they're kind of expanding on what vine sort of already did well and taking it one step further so i don't know what the key differentiator between this and instagram is i personally if i'm looking at two apps i prefer instagram like i think instagram's doing a better job of discovery so really figure out what the core problem you're trying to solve here because it seems like it's a vitamin sort of a nice to have and then i don't know right now i don't think we need more nice to haves yeah. All right. And I mean, just I, to to not yeah. discourage anyone here, like an app like Be Real, <laughs> um, they've been around for a couple of years now, and we're only hearing about them now, right? So I think that that just sort of shows that there is, if with the right strategy, um, you know, yes, there probably needs to be some money behind that, but you never know what you could accomplish. So feel free to disagree about the money part. One thing I did want to end with was, you know, there's this great article. You saw a 236% increase in subscriptions. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was when you were working with Bravo and you were trying to unlock more growth, what was the channel that you, what was the marketing channel that you used that you're like, hey, this is really worked out for us. You know, we want to focus and put more of our efforts into this marketing channel. Influencer marketing. <laughs> really? Yeah, talk to me a little bit about you said the yeah. micro influencers too. What was your strategy there? Yeah, so How are you working with these micro we we started off by creating like an ambassador program. Um, so we had um active flipped users that we knew also were micro influencers and had a pretty solid um loyal following on their own Instagram channels, um, which I think helps. And similar to uh, the photo sharing app, you know, if you can get an influencer or a micro influencer using your product. Um, they're going to be like, and they, if they love it, they're going to be your biggest champions and potentially like your earliest adopters to help with your growth. Um, and so that's what we did. We noticed that we had some of these people using flipped. Um, and so we just wanted to leverage their, um, their clout and their, uh, reliability, credibility within the study gram community. Um, and so we paid them to, to help us share the platform with other people. Um, they had like a unique 
deep link that we could track their performance um, and how many people understand how many people they were driving to the app. Um, and so that was, that was, I think, quite um, a game changer for us early days where we were um, really tapping into the StudyGram community and um, like infiltrating that community so that everyone who is there, you could be following, like you could be one, one user who's following five study grammars. And if all of them are talking about flipped, you're going to be like, what is this flip thing? I'm going to download it. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was definitely one path that um, I think in the last couple of years has made a really solid impact on our growth. Were you, so these were, if I were summarizing this, these were users already using flipped that became, or were also influencers. For the most part, that was how it started. Yeah, that's how it started. Okay. But then like we would identify people who were potentially um, good influencers um, when Instagram was was more the more popular app at the time. Um, uh -huh. And then we've since expanded to doing our own outreach to people who fit the same persona who may not be using Flipped. Um, but, you know, we incentivize them with like free access to Flipped, we pay them and then they run like giveaway campaigns. We actually just did one a week ago um, for back to school. Oh, nice. Um, but then they also, they create reels for us um, and TikToks for us where they're just, we, we let them really let their own brand shine, but we're trying to get them to talk nice. about their favorite features and, and why their followers should also use Flipped. Thanks. Nice. Can I try to find it? Yeah. What, what should I mean for this, the new program? Uh, if you just, I mean, it, it's actually on their, all of their accounts. So you'd have to go to the study grammars. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Let's <laughs> yeah. Um, probably. <laughs> Are you on Instagram right now? I am. Sorry. Yeah, I'll show you what I'm seeing. Uh, uh, study smart with Chris. If they're, yeah, if that's just showing the top post, it's not showing recent. So, um, maybe I have to go see. into Instagram. I could show you one quickly, like if you looked up Adina studies, um, she was one of our giveaway posts. Studies. Adina, Adina, so with a D. A D E N A. Yeah. I A D I. Yep. Yeah. So she's a great example of a micro influencer that we work with. Um, and if you scroll down to the third, uh, I think the third section, we have one of her recent posts with us. Oh, there you go. Giveaway. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's just, that's honestly just one example. Um, we have done hundreds of posts like that. Um, is it just finding with Adina and then messaging her and be like, Hey, we love your profile. We, we have this great app. We'd love to work with, with you. Is, is it just as um, easy as that? I mean, more or less, I would say that it's, it's taken having um, a credible brand as well, that um, we're just not yeah. some random person or company reaching out to them. So they take a look at, our past posts with other influencers, they understand like, okay, this is actually like a legit platform to be working with. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, we've, that, that, that is pretty much what we do. We reach out to people who we think would be the right persona to, to help um, target our audience. And it tends to be um, study grammars typically. So people who are like that high achieving student persona that I mentioned before. Honestly, I, have, I had no idea what study grammars were. But that's really interesting. <laughs> one of the questions was like, how are you targeting these high achieving students? And I guess it's like through influencers and through Studygram. It's just just like people who talk about studying on Instagram. Is that what Studygram is? Yeah, you should spend some time taking a look. It's quite the community. <laughs> <laughs> they're uh yeah they're they're high achieving students a lot of them are medical students or they're they're taking really challenging programs that um require a lot of their energy and so they they sort of like 
feel a connection with their audience and um, the community that they build through sharing their experiences as students. So like they take um, reels that are like a day in the life of a med student or they share like examples of their study notes and study tips and all that, all that cool stuff. So yeah. <laughs> I love it. Once again, it is flipped F L I P D flipped. You can go to flippedapp.co. All these links are into the, are in the YouTube description, or you can just search for Flip on your favorite app store. And if you want to work with Bravo and try to win the twenty five, you or you can win <laughs> up to twenty five thousand dollars of no fee funding. Go to just get bravo.com. You'll see that banner at the very top, and then you have a chance to win the twenty five thousand, and then. It, all eligible entrants will get one year free of Bravo Analytics. And with Bravo Analytics, do you need an SDK or is it just connecting a bunch of things and then they give you the high level insights that you need? Uh, you just no connect SDK your app there. store. Yeah, no, you just okay. connect your app store analytics. Mm -hmm. Now that's very cool. So all that is in the show notes as well. Lana, is there anything that you want to make sure we say we, we covered before we say goodbye? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. I hope that it, some of my feedback has been helpful. And uh, if anyone has any any of the apps that we audited today, if they want some follow up feedback, I'd be happy to help. Oh, that's very generous of you. So go go reach out to her. Her LinkedIn is in the show notes as well. <laughs> you want to reach Anna. But Anna, thank you so much for coming on and doing this. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And join us. Thanks for having join me. Join us next Friday where we're going to have my old friend Haim back on the YouTube live stream. We're going to talk about common mistakes that you have to avoid when you're planning out your app. You know, we talked about it here, product market fit, what features you want to build. He's going to talk to you from a development standpoint. Hey, here are the things that crazy entrepreneurs tell me, and these are the mistakes that you want to avoid. So join us every Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific. And that's it. Have a great weekend. Sorry for all the technical problems. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.